Okay, it's 12 o'clock, so um, we'll make a start. Thank you for joining us, everyone. It's lovely to see everybody online today. Um, hope everyone's having a good week and that you're managing to stay safe and well. Um, my name's Sally Williams, and I look after the Help Force Network. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, V Tran, online, who is our Knowledge and Content Manager. So V will be um, chipping in with questions and suggestions at various points through the session, no doubt. Um, we're really pleased today to be able to um, bring to you a webinar focusing on remote or virtual volunteering roles. Um, we know from our conversations with you uh, that many traditional volunteering roles are no longer safe or possible even, um, and that consequently virtual volunteering is emerging as, as the new way of offering support to people, whether they're patients or staff or um, people in their own communities. Um, we're really thrilled today. We've got four volunteer leaders from across the UK who've generously agreed to share with us their ideas and experiences and they're learning from having implemented virtual volunteering roles. So we hope the next hour will hold lots of inspiration and practical advice. And um, of course, we look forward to hearing your questions. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. We are going to be recording the session, just to let you know. Um, but this will enable us to um, share it with people who weren't able to attend after the event. Um, with our four speakers, we've, we're going to allow five minutes per speaker, followed immediately by five minutes per question. And then when everybody has, has um, done their presentation, we're going to have time for general questions at the end that we'll put to either an individual speaker or to the panel. So you can use your hand function. Um, so that we can speak directly to each other and have a conversation, or you can use the chat box, whichever you prefer. Um, if we do run out of time for questions, we will um, keep hold of them and try and get answers for you after the session today. So if you miss your opportunity, don't despair. Uh, so today we've we've got four speakers, as I said, we've got um, Laura Shalev Green from Kingston Hospital. Um, we have Sharon Nobbs from Humber Teaching Hospitals. We've got Nuria de Miguel from Central and Northwest London, and Jill Cook, who's uh, from children's hospices across Scotland. So we have a, a wide range of experiences. Um, so I'd like to start off by introducing Laura from Kingston. Um, thank you, Laura. It's lovely to have you on board, and thanks for kindly agreeing to share your knowledge with us. That's OK. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Laura um, and I work for an acute hospital in South West London. Um, I've got um, when when the pandemic struck back in March, we paused all of our um, active volunteering and I got a very strong brief um, to do, to really go back to the drawing board and develop a new model of volunteering. Um, and so the route that we've taken is twofold. Um, we've gone with virtual volunteering and we've gone with integrated integrated care pathways so getting our volunteers mobilized to take on COVID-19 roles in the community on behalf of the hospital but I'll focus on the virtual volunteering because that's the focus of the webinar so I just wanted to mention four initiatives that we've developed since March um, some of them were existing services that we've transitioned online and others were um, our new initiatives so if I start if I just kind of go straight in um, the first role to talk about is our um, virtual dementia volunteering. So I should say that two of these roles are via app and two of these roles are via telephone. So we're mixing kind of the digital and the telephony um, solutions to implement our virtual volunteering. But if I start with dementia, we've got um, six active dementia volunteers. They were existing dementia volunteers doing therapeutic activities on the wards prior to COVID. Um, we've harnessed an app called Atonics, um, a touch away, which is a more secure version of Zoom. Um, so it, it plays the same function, but there's no exchange of, of contact details and you can't see the volunteers contact details and they can't see the hospital's contact details. Um, they're providing therapeutic activities via a tablet computer. Um, 
And one thing I will say is that it's reliant on having a really strong clinical ally. In fact, all of these roles are reliant on having a really strong clinical ally to act as a facilitator on the ward. So the facilitator in our trust is the therapeutic activities coordinator. There's set times that the service runs, so it runs twice a day for an hour and the volunteer is connected via the TouchAway app to the patient where they're, whereby they're conducting therapeutic, therapeutic activities that might be reading to them, that might be reminiscence therapy, it could be playing some music and doing reminiscence alongside the music. Um, we've had concerts um, for groups, so people can play a musical instrument, we've had concerts for groups, so they're doing both group and one-to-one -one activities, so that's our dementia offer. Um, we're also doing physiotherapy support via an app, the same app, the Atonics Touch Away, and they're called Gentle Movement Volunteers. So we've trained these volunteers in a range of bed based and chair based exercises. And we have some physiotherapy students who are our clinical allies and they are um, they're assessing the patient as safe to move. They're diagnosing the patients and prescribing the exercises and then the volunteers are coming in via a touch away remotely to go through those exercises with the patient. They're providing loads of encouragement, motivation, um, demonstrating the exercises, kind of say, look, if I'm going to be silly in my living room, you can be, you can feel a bit daft in your um, hospital chair, but we're going to do leg raises and we're going to do 10 reps. So they're kind of a bit like Joe Wicks, um, uh, coaches and mentors around gentle movements. And we have that running twice a day as well. Um, the third offer that we have is our discharge support service. So prior to COVID, the discharge support service was initiated at bedside almost at the point of admission. So as soon as somebody's estimated discharge date was identified, our volunteers would be connected with the patient. They would do a holistic needs assessment, looking at safe, well and warm as criteria for going home. And the whole objective of the service is to prevent deconditioning when somebody goes home and pr promote re-enablement. So it acts as a community connecting service, connecting patients who might be at risk of social isolation, at risk of, so of deconditioning to local services that are going to su support and promote their well-being. We transitioned that service online. Um, it's now a telephone based service. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about information governance um, and data protection. So I welcome those questions because we did a lot of work um, to identify how we get the patient's data to the volunteer safely and securely. Um, it's, it's, um, I will be honest and say that it's recognised as a risk, so it's on our risk register, but it's a tolerated risk and I've done a lot of work to mitigate it. Um, that service is um, provided to the patient for a period of six weeks, at which point they are discharged, so we're quite boundaried in how long the service um, lasts for, and by which point the patient should be connected to a range of local voluntary organisations that are going to support and enhance their well-being when the hospital pulls back. And we've got a caseload of about 30 patients with our discharge support service. And then the final service I wanted to mention is a partner service um, that we've set up with Macmillan Cancer Support. Um, so previously we had, as many hospitals do, a Macmillan drop-in centre, which is primarily an information service, but also refers and signposts to two other services, sorry, three, complementary therapies, counselling and, um, not debt management, um, benefits advice. We've transitioned that online using a telephony solution uh, with a company called Caritech Horizon. And what that does is um, it, creates a hospital telephone number that the volunteers can twin their phones with from home. So it protects it protects the volunteers contact details. The volunteer can operate from home, but it's a hospital led service. So the patient is dialing a hospital number and then it's being routed electronically to the patient to the volunteers home telephone. So they're delivering um, advice on information. So they're doing information prescribing they're doing referrals and signposting to the counselling, the um, financial benefits service, and they're also providing a listening ear and emotional support via telephone. So that's our kind of complement of services. We're also running a message to a loved one, and that's by email. And I know a lot of um, organisations have set up something similar, but that's really the offer I wanted to talk through. I've kind of talked at quite a pace, so I really welcome any, any questions or thoughts that you've got on what we offer. And I'm so curious to learn about what other trusts are doing as well. Laura, thank you so much. I know that it was a whistle-stop tour, but you've packed a lot in there and some really great ideas and um, we're hoping for some fantastic questions. Um, 
somebody Cynthia asked about the spelling of atonics and uh, but Jessica has responded um, is it A-E-T-O-N-I-X for anyone who wants to Google that. Could you just explain a bit more about what that is, Laura, the, the, um, the platform, how that works? Um, yes. Um, so, it, I mean, it's a very simple app. It's free to download. Um, the, the hospital has a tablet computer that has um, the account for a touch away. And then the volunteer downloads the app to their phone, whether that's a, uh, an Android or an iPhone. Um, and we use our hospital account to connect with the volunteer. So you search for a contact and then if they've got an account with the Touchway, you'll be, you'll, that contact will pop up and you just click, click befriend or connect, whatever it is. Um, and then the two of you are connected. And then in order to make a call, you just press a simple, a simple button. Um, so it's, it works in exactly the same way as Zoom, um, but it's apparently, according to our IT, um, more secure and they're both the hospital details and the volunteers details are protected so at no point can the patient access those volunteers contact details. Okay lovely thanks Laura. Um, Sharon's asked if you've had many issues with volunteers struggling to access the tech and the apps that are involved. No but we've got staff that give volunteers a massive virtual cuddle and really help them uh, so I'm thinking about our um, the lead for the Macmillan information line. She she's really nurturing of her volunteers. We've had loads of webinars with them. We've done cheat sheets um, with images demonstrating how you download the app, and we've provided telephone support. So we've put in a lot of a lot of support um, so that the volunteers don't have any trouble accessing the tech. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I and mean, you mentioned about information governance and that you'd had to do a lot of work on mitigating um, potential risks. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yes. Um, so we, it was specific to the discharge um, support line because volunteers are calling patients. So they needed patient data. So we set up um, NHS.net accounts for all of all of those volunteers. They've all got enhanced DBS checks and they're all um, well trained and well known to the organisation. Um, and we download only the need to know um, information from the patient's record. So that's their name, their date of birth, um, their next of kin, their GP contact details. And that's it. They don't get any information about their condition, what, the, what their um, acute presentation was. They simply get the contact details and a, and a briefing from the service manager as to why they've been referred and what their um, what the referrer what the referrer's goals were. So whether that was a physiotherapist that referred into the service, an OT might have been a frailty um, someone from the frailty team. We ask what their objective for that person's rehabilitation and well-being is. So they get a very um, quite a minimal handover with essential need to know information. Um, that wasn't good enough for our um, information governance team. So what we have done is raise it as a corporate risk, um, but a very well mitigated risk. So the volunteers are trained on data protection twice. They get their mandatory training. They're also doing the e-learning for health um, uh, data protection course. We've done additional data protection training with them specific to the service. We've done um, home workplace assessments to assess their environments and make sure that the environment in, the, in which they're conducting the call is safe to work and you know secure and confidential. Um, those are the main mitigations. And then it's NHS to NHS, NHS net to NHS.net, which is a secure platform. So we've raised this as a, as a corporate risk. It's gone onto the risk register and it's um, been assessed as tolerable. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Laura. I'm sure there will be other questions once people get their heads around the implications of it, but that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to move on to our next speaker now. So thank you so much, Laura. I'm sure uh, we'll be coming back to you during the next um, half an hour or so. So thank you for your time today. Um, see you shortly. So I'm now going to introduce Sharon Nobbs. Um, Sharon's volunteer coordinator from Humber Teaching Hospitals. So welcome, Sharon. Are you there? Hi. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi. So, I'm Sharon. I'm from, um, as Sally's just said, from Humber Teaching NHS Foundation Trust, uh, and we're in Hull. 
Um, we set up a telephone befriending service uh, in March last year, but it was very quickly set up, obviously, in the response to, to COVID and the lockdown. And the, the reason we did that is that um, our voluntary services team have five social inclusion groups that we run for people with dementia, um, vulnerable people, people with learning disabilities. And obviously, with the lockdown um, coming to, to fruition and it you know, these people weren't going to have access to anybody. We were quite concerned about the, the loneliness and isolation these people would have and, and where that would end up. So we, we really needed to keep in touch with them. So um, what we did was um, we decided to ring round all our service users and we asked them, uh, we approached the subject of a telephone befriending service and we asked what kind of things they would want from it and what, what they thought about it really. And we did the same with all our volunteers as well. And we did a collaboration between all the ideas we came up with of what was what was needed and um, we hence launched this service. Um, so we've got, a, we did have a team of about 20 volunteers and they had about maybe three or four uh, service users that they would contact twice a week. Just a bit of a chat, just to find out about the well-being, just to see if there was OK. Um, and what we've um, we've then did a survey to find out what people were thinking about it. And is this actually what you was thinking and what you was hoping for? And um, we were absolutely overwhelmed by the response that we've got from the service users. And, you know, when you, you get comments from them, things like um, it's a lifeline and it's the only thing in, in my day to look forward to, um, you know, th those things really touch base with us. And, and it's obviously something that's been desperately needed. So we've started to expand uh, what we've been doing and we've now got uh, 60 to 80 volunteers and we're also expanding um, the people that we're taking on so not just our service users from our groups but we're also taking on um, discharged patients from our inpatient units and our community mental health teams as well um, and it's people who are very similar to our service users who are at risk of social isolation so they've been part of our system loads of people taking care of them and then they're returning home on their own and it's it's a vicious cycle because obviously they're sat on their own, they're lonely, they don't know what to do with their thoughts. And inevitably, within a few weeks, they're back in our systems again. And really all they need is maybe just a friend, someone to just chat and, and just air some of the views with. So, um, as I said, we've now got 60 to 80 volunteers who are just doing that one service. And we've got over 100 service users now that we're now looking after, which is fantastic. Um, but we're now having to, to backpedal a bit because we set things up so quickly. Um, we did get in touch with our info governance team because obviously that's a big part of it. And how are we going to make these calls um, as safely as possible? We had no systems in place set up, uh, but it needed to happen quite quickly. So we've put together a telephone befriending guide which had signposting, uh, do's and don'ts. We got in touch with our psychology and emotional well-being service type tips of things that, you know, if someone approaches you with this, these are the types of things you can answer. But the bottom line was, as volunteers, we're there to listen. We're not counsellors. We can't change the world for them. The point of it is that we're there and we're that friendly ear that they know that, that there's going to be there every week. So we put that together with some signposting that might be helpful for them. We also did a confidentiality agreement um, in collaboration with our information governance team to just make sure that, you know, our volunteers, because they're working from home now, that they make sure that our service user numbers are safe and they're kept secure. Uh, they don't have them on any, you know, emails, documents, anything like that. And what we do is we would phone them, pass them the information on, and they would use the home phones, uh, but they would press um, the 141, you know, to disguise the number or put a, a, a call blocker on the mobile. So what we're actually looking at now, which we're hoping to do in the next few weeks, is set up a soft phones device, which is very similar to what, Laura, you were speaking about. Um, and it's, it's basically something they can download an app um, or they can do it on the laptop top and they would have our central number that they would call from and the best part about that is that you can also pay for an upgrade on that which can record calls so we've approached again our volunteers and said this is what we're thinking a few of the volunteers were a bit at first a bit oh, well, why would you want to record the calls and so we explained you know the, the reason we're wanting to call uh, record calls is obviously for the protection of the service users and also for our volunteers as well because we're not there to you know if any allegations are made i mean we've been very fortunate we've had nothing like that at all but you never know and it's just that that peace of mind to make sure that the governance is is covered so that's something that we're putting in place quite soon 
and our our surface users and volunteers are quite are quite pleased with that and where that's going. Um, so we we actually entered the help forces. Uh, big thank you to volunteers, and we were really fortunate that we we're on their wall of fame with our um, with our projects that we've done. So thank you for asking us to come and come and speak about it. Um, I'm not sure if I've probably missed loads of things, but if there's any other questions. Um, I'd love to answer them. <laughs> oh, hi. Thank you, Sharon. That, that's really helpful. It's lovely to meet you as well. You know, yeah, you too. In person. So that's well, as close as to in person as we can get at the moment. <laughs> um, several people are asking for any documents um, regarding information governance that they'd be really grateful if you could share them with us. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all we've got at the moment is our telephone befriending guide, um, and we've got our confidentiality agreement, which I'm more than happy to put to put in the chat. Um, the other thing that we're, we're using is regarding the soft phones, but we're still we're still putting that together. But again, if I'll put me me email uh, in the chat if you want to email me about it. Once that's complete, I'm more than happy to share. But the the governance of that obviously is going to be a little bit different because we've got to make sure that all parties are happy that the calls are going to be recorded and. So that's that's work in progress, but say we're open in the next few weeks that that's something that we're going to be completing. Brilliant. And someone, Christine, has asked, what is the name of your soft phone app? Does it have a um, specific name? Or? Well, I've it, on my. I'm just looking at it now on my screen, and it says <laughs> Office UC, and I've actually been able to download that on my mobile phone through um, is it Google Play. And it, it was on it was on there. Um, so it just says Office UC, uh, and I think it, this this works through KCOM, which is our uh, you know telephone um, system that's in Hull. So I imagine there'll be a BT or something very similar type of thing. But it, it basically rings. It, it looks like a, mo um, a phone on your screen, and it rings through and it takes messages. Um, but you talk to it just like I'm talking to you now. You don't need any headphone devices, anything like that. So it, it is quite quite good. We've been using it through the NHS and obviously to roll this out to volunteers. Um, I think it'd be really, really simple to use, actually. Um, but the reason I asked Laura about um, whether she'd have problems with people downloading it, we do have volunteers who are, dare I say, 60 plus fantastic telephone befrienders but to actually get them to download the apps that we need has taken quite a lot of TLC mm -hmm. uh, because they're not they're not technical they just want to pick the phone up and, and ring so it's about trying to find other ways around it and, and ways we can include them as well um, so that that has been one one sticking point that we've had that's great thanks Sharon all really helpful stuff um, and Laura has asked how do you know when the services come to an end do you have a time limit or is it just um, more sort of organic than that? Well, for our service users, because they would be intending our face to face groups, the idea was that it was until we can go back into groups. So we're going to continue that, uh, you know, as a replacement, if you like. Obviously, it can't replace face to face, but it's the best we can do at the moment. But yeah, it's an interesting question for these new ones that we're taking on these um, discharged patients. What we've decided is to put a 12 week uh, limit on it and then review the situation. Um, but obviously the, the idea of the befriending service is to give them someone who um, who is there for them, who, who will support them, who can talk through things with them. But the signposting is a major part of it. So it might be that someone's lonely and isolated and actually joining a local group or maybe a library group, a walking group might be all that they need to actually feel more more secure so at that point if things like that are put in place the plan the plan is that we could then terminate the calls because they've moved on to other things so at this moment in time thanks to our good friend boris and putting the lockdown on ever ever extended at the moment we've still got We've still got them all holding on. Uh, we've got a couple who sort of feel as though it's given them more confidence and they've decided that actually that they'd like to now leave the service because it's given them more confidence to talk to people, which is really good. So I'm hoping when we can get more out and about, we can put more things in place to get people more secure, less reliant, if you like, mm -hmm. on our befrienders. And what we'd also like to do, which I'd also like to add, is our telephone befrienders that we've signed up, what we do want to do is we, we think that there's a place for telephone befriending, absolutely. But when things go back a bit more face to face, we're wanting our befriending volunteers to then be part of 
more groups, more social inclusion activities, even volunteering opportunities for some of these service users so that we can get more things happening out and about um, for, for them to be involved in. Mm. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I mean, it, I'm sure there's loads more questions we could ask. I wish we had more time. Um, Nicola's asked, how do you get patients to be on board with the technology? And uh, Laura's um, suggestion is give them lots of cheat sheets and webinars and put <laughs> it all together. So, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Sharon. I, I, no doubt there'll be more questions later on in the session, but for now, um, thanks so much. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, so Nuria is next. Nuria de Miguel. Nuria is from um, Central and Northwest London Hospitals. Hi, Nuria. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi, Hello, welcome. everyone. Thank you for having me here. And I had, um, you know, I had prepared a presentation a little bit about the digital befriended volunteer role that we have in one of our hospitals in um, North London, in St. Charles, uh, no, St. Pancras, sorry, near King's Cross. But then listening to Laura, I realized, oh my God, we're doing so many other things and I didn't think about them. So, you know, the first part of the presentation might have a little bit more of a structure than the rest that I will be telling you later on. So I've been with uh, CNWL for three months now. So lots of the projects that we have, I can have like I have kind of like inherited them. They started before me. They're developing and growing even more now. So first of all, we have a befriender um, digital volunteer. Um, we call them befriender and virtual visiting volunteer in one of our hospitals in North London. And obviously this role started on the first um, wave of the pandemic when suddenly, you know, people were in hospital, there were no visitors allowed on what were these, um, you know, what were our patients going to do? This is a physical rehabilitation hospital. So most of the patients that we are there, they're older people, they have, they might have a stroll or a fall and they, they're there in hospital not having anyone to to talk to and also not even maybe you know having a smartphone or a phone uh, like that themselves so during the first wave we suddenly got 70 ipad that they were distributed to different inpatient units but there was no support there was no help there was no instructions about how to use this ipad it's like there you go you have some ipads and now do whatever you want or whatever you can to do with them. Um, obviously, the iPads were to be used to connect the patients with the family when the when the visits not allowed. But as I said, they were not even knowing how to use a phone. So then it's everything started with like a generic volunteering uh, war assistant uh, that they were like you know doing a little bit of like everything that was needed uh, in the war but we have this kind of like a star gem volunteer uh, that's kind of like you know created this project for us she was um she had just recently been a uh, main redundant and she was an it person and she had plenty of time to give us so she took this under under the under her wing and created the created everything. She set up a system for using and borrowed these tablets. She started all the processes. Uh, you know, she started like um, enabling these calls to happen. Uh, so that's kind of like you know where we started uh, and then where we are into now. So now we have everything that it's needed to be using these tablets. We have like you know all the kind of like you know information governance or the systems in place and procedures. Uh, the new role is more focused instead of being a general war assistant role is just focus on that kind of like befriending so helping arranging and um, making the calls so there is a diary system where people can uh, request a call to be made to a patient or uh, a patient can request a call to be made out and um, the tablets are also used for entertainment a little bit so they're used for radio apparently reception is really really bad there so some people use it to go to the radio some of the patients that we have there there is a patient that loves guitars now at the moment so he just kind of like you know uh, searches for and looks at guitars um, and the volunteers as well they are there for like company chat chat with the patients and they are usually in hospital for at least three hours a day and they're on a rota system so lots of the people that that are there you know they will be there on like Wednesdays a.m or Thursdays p.m for example um, the issue that we have 
in the first wave and the learning that we got when we restarted this role once again in October, it was support for the volunteers. Uh, the volunteers were like at the beginning, they were a little bit like left to their own devices. So obviously, you know, we had some star volunteers and they would be very happy uh, to do things themselves. But then some others they needed a bit more kind of like, you know, guidance. So now we have much more stronger process in place. We have an induction that it's done online uh, with a group of volunteers about what the role is and what the hospital is like, but there is also like kind of like in person on the first day and now we are in a position of having enough volunteers to do kind of like batting or pairing within reason. Uh, we give them training uh, around those areas and especially obviously, you know, around like PPE and how to safely volunteer. They go through a risk assessment, occupational health assessment, DVS checks, uh, lateral flow testing, and they also have access with the COVID vaccine. So we make sure that they're safe while they're volunteering there. And then in regards to the tablets, we have proper systems and security in place at the moment. They're used 95% uh, for video calls and they're never uh, left unattended. Like volunteers would be around, would be hand delivering then, you know, obviously they might leave the room, but they're making the call. But if they're left unattended for whatever reason, there is a clear protocol about resetting, clear, you know, wiping down the surfaces. Um, and so far, so good, fingers crossed, no uh, information governance have happened, no issues at all. We they were thinking that maybe it's because of the client group. We don't know, but you know, we are quite happy with that. Uh, we have, as I said before, that kind of like process to, to book the calls. There is like um, there is a lot of infrastructure on the background. On uh, we have an MS Teams groups, and the MS Teams groups they have like a dedicated team leader, which is like um, this um, a star volunteer who is now a patient IT lead for the trust. So on the MS Teams platforms, they can book the calls, they can request other calls. There is a task planner, so they can look at the things that they can do every day, a rota information and resources so it's kind of like continually continually evolving there is also a whatsapp group in case that they need something like really really quick and then every two weeks there is a catch up with the volunteers uh, the idea is to kind of like build that kind of like team spirit and share issues concern and do some kind of like quick training bites especially lots of issues that have come up now as we are in this kind of like you know high alert uh, in regards to like you know be covid safe in the future, we want to export this model to other sites and, you know, they diversify a little bit uh, the range of the volunteers that we have uh, and also teach the patients how to use those digital devices um, and um, involving the service users on to on um, involving the service users and getting uh, them to be volunteers themselves. So this is kind of like, you know, kind of the, the, the flagship role that we were having at, at the moment in one of the hospitals, but then we have a similar befriending role as um, Sharon was saying. So it's called checking and chat and basically is like age chats during eight weeks. So we have a, and everything obviously is befriending over the phone. We kind of like um, describe it as a friendly chat with our neighbor over the fence. So it's not clinical and it's not counseling and it's nothing like that. We are a mental health trust. So all the patients that they are referred to us, they come from like the majority of them come from like mental health services. We have some from like dementia services or um, learning disabilities, but most of them they were coming from mental health services and uh, we set up checking and chat already again back in May and we supported over like 140 patients or service users to get this call with a group of trained volunteers. Uh, the volunteers were listening, side posting and supporting these people. They were going through, you know, all the checks that every other volunteer does, but also through a very thorough training that takes place over one day in Zoom when they talk about, you know, not only listening skills, but mental health problems and, um, you know, what to do if uh, suicide issues uh, um, and then safeguarding uh, and data protection, because one of the one of the requirements for this role as well is to send that back notes that we can update in our clinical systems. So there is a lot of like, you know, GDPR involved as well. We have a standard procedure plan in place. We have the um, information governance team on board when everything was set up. So we have for these volunteers, same as for everyone else, the DBS checks and um, the, you know, references 
but we give them an NHS email addresses. Uh, they also have a um, device that we provide for them, so they have a smartphone at the moment. We, they, we used to give them some kind of like, you know, uh, phones, but they were really, really basic. So they, the connection, they have lots of connection issues. So now they have proper smartphones and they do this training as well and then we do kind of like you know we restarted the service for around christmas time when all the when um you know all the restrictions started again so we step it up at that time and we have like a follow-up with volunteers uh, after the session so we kind of like we get regular feedback and we will be getting regular feedback from them as how we can as how we can um, you know, support them and then make the service even better. Uh, one of the things that I have to say is like our volunteers, uh, you know, they are supported as well by clinical teams. So they, every volunteer, we have a supervisor. So the idea is that we have one volunteer chatter that will call three people and then each supervisor will have three chatters and they will be kind of like, you know, they can send them back the notes and they will also have supervision on kind of like a weekly or every two weeks basis. So if anything happens, there is, there's all with like a clinical team there in the background that can be supporting then all of the patients that they get referred to us they need to be part of a cnwl and they need to be part of cnwl for the eight weeks that the service uh, runs over and at the moment what we are doing is like embedding the volunteers into the clinical team so we are kind of like you know the brain team maybe we're um, sending them like three volunteers and then we're sending five volunteers to like um, the harrow team uh, and the service was so popular when it was launched in May that now we have an offer for carers. So carers can also be referred and be part of uh, this service and also get the support from a trained volunteer for those eight weeks for to have a chat. And you know, the volunteers are always saying nice things about how much they enjoy this role. One of them say like after my first call, I couldn't stop smiling for the rest of the day. And then um, the feedback that we got from one of our service users was like, it's like having you in my living room. So it really kind of like, you know, help cheering up people as well during this time. Um, we have a resource pack, a full resource pack that we give out to the volunteers because the idea is like kind of like as a dynamic service is eight weeks. It's not like long term uh, befriending, so they can give them kind of like, you know, the resource pack has information about other things that they might be able to be doing in their community in, later on. And we have user acceptance agreements for their smartphones, so they have to like read and sign then once that uh, before they receive the phone. We get the phones delivered by volunteer drivers as well. Uh, so kind of like you know maximizing volunteer involvement there and they all of them uh, like every other volunteer they have signed but uh, confidentiality and volunteering volunteering agreements and, la and the last thing that we are doing now is we are getting some digital volunteer um, enablers so basically we are going to be teaching digital skills to patients and um, carers and we are still kind of like you know in process of setting that up that was part of the winter volunteering program uh, funding that we got so we will get that but, um, in the next coming months, but um, yeah, I have lots of you know information. I will put my email in the chat box if anyone wants to get in touch, and obviously you know the resources and things like that. I'm more than happy to share what we have. Some of them that are still in draft, some of them that are already kind of like signed off. But yeah, I think that you know I have found everything that uh, as a new staff member I have found uh, helpful, really really useful. So I'm very happy to like you know be able to give back some of the things that we also have thank you thank you for listening thank you so much that was fantastic um and uh, a lot of information there for pe people to digest so um, i'm sure there'll be more questions later on in the session i wonder if we could ask if you'd be able to share your resource pack um that you mentioned that would be really helpful um so if you could put a link in the chat box or email it to to me or v and we can share it with everybody That'd be great. Thank you ever so much. We need to keep moving because uh, time's getting short. Um, so last but definitely not least, can I introduce Jill Cook? Um, Jill is Volunteering Development Manager for Children's Hospices across Scotland. Welcome, Jill. Hi, Jill. Are you there? Just give me a second. Sorry, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Thank you, um, th thank you for inviting a uh, chance to this webinar. Um, as you say, um, 
children's hospices across Scotland have got two hospice facilities. Um, we have Rachel House, which is in the east of Scotland, and Robin House is based in the west. But we also have a Chaz at Home service, um, a couple of bases up in the north, but at, that actually covers the whole of Scotland. So at the moment, Chaz has just got over 300 employees, but we're outnumbered by volunteers three to one. So like many organisations at the beginning of the pandemic, we had to stand down um, over 900 volunteers. We had then had to mobilise very quickly to create um, a virtual hospice. And that was with a multidisciplinary team comprising of care, clinical, volunteering, fundraising, corporate services and communications departments. So the first thing we looked at doing was designing what new services do, uh, do we need to offer? So we allocated some of the staff um, to make what we called kindness calls, and that would be, excuse me, <coughs> and that would be staff like our key workers. So they would phone allocated families once or perhaps twice a week to offer telephone support and identify if there was any additional needs. And some of the things that came up from those calls that um, some of the families were struggling to get food supplies or they were unable to get prescriptions picked up so um, and the other thing was tech for homeschooling was huge so we actually managed to access laptops and iPads and get them to the families that desperately needed them. We organised virtual visits so for instance for preschool children we had a bear hunt uh, virtually and for eight to 11 year olds we had a wizards weekend and we also held a weekend for teenagers which was very successful. We also um, set up a letter writing service and at the moment we've got about 43 children receiving regular um, fortnightly mail from volunteers and that also includes some of our referred um, children and for some of these um, kids it was the first time they'd ever received mail that was just for them and of course we usually include things like um, stickers um, and puzzles in them so what's not to love about getting something through the post that's fun to open. We also set up a storytelling service. So our volunteers that had been stood down, some of them um, uploaded videos onto our YouTube channel. And um, one of them was lucky enough, uh, Julie, who does storytelling and Makaton and uh, was lucky enough to be on the, the Hall of Fame, um, which was great. And others were doing storytelling on a one-to-one -one basis. And that was usually through the Zoom platform eh, with families. And that's been lovely to see how their relationships developed each week with the volunteer and the young person. We've sent out hundreds of activity packs with games, puzzle, rep recipes, and simple crafts to families. So that was all things that we hadn't really done before. We too set up a telephone befriending service and my background's in helplines. So I was really keen for that to take off. But strangely enough, because our staff are still doing the kind kindness calls, um, it's probably the timing wasn't quite right for that. And I think once the kindness calls come to an end, then we can relook at the telephone and befriending it, Chaz. So, um, so what we're doing, uh, the existing services that we've been um, delivering virtually, we've had clown doctors, we've delivered um, over 500 hours in partnership with Hearts and Minds. So that's one-to-one um, -one sessions or group sessions um, for the children and families. Um, similarly, we've had art therapy and weekly music therapy sessions, usually on Zoom. And we've um, delivered family support to over 670 um, families, and that could be individual work, one-to-one -one support. We've also got a benefits advisor, um, and we've had lots of socials on Zoom as well. And one of the things that we did for the first time is our remembering days that we have for both Rachel and Robin House. Um, we did them for the first time virtually, and that was doing things like lighting a candle for every child that had died um, in the past year, an activity to do at home, um, lots of readings, and of course, music. And we found out we would had our biggest ever attendance at these. So we are going to keep that, as well as doing it face-to-face, -face, the virtual um, the virtual 
platform has opened up an audience that we wouldn't normally have had. So that's been really fabulous, actually. We're also doing bereavement support um, virtually and where possible. Um, we're also doing walk and talk um, bereavement sessions if that's if we're able to do that. Um, and we also delivered our home support. So our home support volunteers would normally be going into a family's home, but we delivered that training for the first time online. And again, fantastic feedback um, from the volunteers and just cuts down uh, travel costs and uh, childcare for people. So th there's lots of benefits in doing things online as well. So some of the learning from our virtual visits, um, the importance of connecting with families and young people who hadn't met before. So we're actually putting families and I would say volunteers in touch with each other virtually that wouldn't normally have met. And both groups have said that's been really beneficial. The families and young people are telling us this works for them. They understand why it's impossible to come in for respite visits just now. And this is a really good way to maintain contact with staff, volunteers and other families. And I think high quality care can be delivered virtually and it has been embedded as part of our normal service delivery now. Um, the platforms we've been using are, are mainly Zoom, Microsoft, Microsoft Teams, um, we've been using WhatsApp and again hiding the number, um, I think as Susan said, and we're also using Near Me for video um, appointments and Chaz has provided mobile phones to the volunteers that are, are home support volunteers that are still having virtual um, contact with our families. So I think the overall learning, I would say that co-production with families is absolutely key. Multidisciplinary working is essential, no surprise there. And it's important that volunteering is integrated into service development. I think with if you clearly demonstrate the impact, which I think we have done, it has directly had a knock on effect on our fundraising efforts, which have been um, actually reasonably healthy, despite the situation that we're all in. And integration of services across care and, and interfaces is now essential. So I think just to sum up, I would say virtual delivery is here to stay and we believe it should not be viewed as second best. So I'm just going to end with feedback from one of our parents who said, we feel more connected with Chaz than ever. The clown doctors, the music sessions and the group catch ups are just fantastic. It makes my day to hear my child's laughter priceless. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Oh, how lovely. Thank you, Jill. That's a really great um, and different perspective uh, from a lot of the um, the uh, examples that we've heard about so far today. So it's great to have your, your involvement. Thank you for joining us. Um, I've got one quite specific question. I was intrigued by your walk and talk um, model of um, support. Could you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it was actually um, it was actually our chaplain um, that had started that, and uh, yeah, we were trying to. Not everybody's comfortable using um, technology, and just some of the uh, some of the families that were perhaps a bit more local to the hospice that she's based in, um, they were just doing literally just meeting up, and we're only able to meet up with one person now outside, and just really doing a bereavement support session while they're walking and talking in a, you know nice surroundings and where where that hospice is based it's actually just on the banks of Loch Lomond so mm -hmm. it's just beautiful surroundings and there's lots of places that are not busy that you could have a private conversation and just be out in the open and the families have absolutely loved that the ones that have been mm -hmm. able to do it yeah it's it's really great how it's opened up a whole new world the, the virtual yeah. model hasn't it so it's, yeah. it's really inspiring thank you um, I'm going to suggest that we open up the floor to um, more general questions for any of our four presenters today. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand or put something in the chat box. Um, and uh, just to start things off, I've, I've quite a general question about boundaries. Um, and uh, you Several people have mentioned about telephone befriending, which it, which is fantastic and something that you know really can make a difference to people. But how do you know? Um, how do you monitor the boundaries? How do you ensure that volunteers are not 
uh, going beyond the boundaries that are safe for themselves and for patients and service users. Can anyone help me with that? Laura, would you like to come in there? Or oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I would say that the supervision, the training, training initially is key. Um, I think the e-learning for health roles and boundaries is very good. Um, but obviously you want you want to have a clear role profile which specifies what the role is not in as much as what it is. Mm. Um, and then that's iterated through training when you when you cover roles and boundaries on the training. And then the supervision, the follow up is key. Um, so, for example, with our discharge support service, they are feeding back case notes routinely, daily, and then we are looking at those case notes and identifying, you know, what is objective and can be discussed, and what is subjective. And actually, that's that's a that's a different aspect. That's for one-to-one -one supervision. Um, so, I think the supervision is probably key to identifying any errors or movement outside of the the role and clarifying what is acceptable and what's not acceptable mm -hmm. yeah I, I would uh, i would agree with what laura said it's very much it's training 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 boundaries is a huge part of the training that uh, we've developed and I'm happy to share the session. It's it's more about home support volunteers, but I'm happy to share the training if anybody would like a copy of that. Yes, please. And I think in supervision and also our volunteers have to fill in a kind of family visit log. So you actually get quite a good sense from what happened in the visit and they're, um, they're also on high alert to pass any information on back to us if there's anything in the family that they've noticed. Um, so we can take action to give additional support or whatever. Thank you, Jill. Sharon, you've got your hand up. Did you want to come in there? Yeah, I was just going to reiterate really what um, what Jill and Laura said. We um, we have a similar kind of system. We're, we're setting up a bit more of a robust um, supervision because uh, at the moment it's sort of been a bit ad hoc, but we've been fortunate really because we've used the volunteers that we already know. Um, so it, the, as we expand and we're developing to volunteers we now don't know that's where some of these problems are going to maybe start happening but the telephone befriending guide that we've had it does sort of cover a lot of the do's and the don'ts and at the end of the day we're not counsellors and things like that but we have had um, some situations where volunteers have got maybe well it, it's an isolated incident well we've had a volunteer who's got quite involved in that um we had a, an autistic gentleman who was on our books and um he wanted to go out and about he's fed up being in the house with covid um as you can appreciate and uh, our volunteer was very very cautious about this and you know he shouldn't be going out because these are the rules and he shouldn't be on the bus and he, he just got himself into a real real stressy situation but what i would say is that we ask that every two weeks every volunteer checks in with us and sends us an email of a reported update so we are able to then flag that quicker so if our volunteer is coming out with all this and oh and he's going out and he's doing this and it's wrong and we can then ring that volunteer and say hang on i think we maybe just need a bit of a chat you know at the end of the day if he's got capacity we can only we can only be there to listen we can only be there to advise um and it's just been able to nip it in the bud because obviously it's a very it's a very emotional situation and I, we want to protect the well-being of our volunteers as well because our volunteers I mean they're lovely and they really do care about the service users that they're ringing but the, they need to also be a bit mindful as well that they can make them decisions and sometimes they're the wrong ones. <laughs> mm. Mm. Thanks thank you thanks Sharon Um I think uh, Pat Pat Hunt's got a question hi Pat. Hi how are you? You're all all right? Thanks. Great. Now, um, there's two questions, really. One is, um, the first one really is for Laura, Laura Shale of Green. Because um, you mentioned, I'm sure it was you, I might even be wrong now I've said that. Um, but you mentioned that um, volunteers that um, had been long standing sort of volunteers. Uh, they were trusted by, you know, they were trustworthy as far as the trust was concerned. Yes. So I just wondered how you got, how you made that decision or how, the, what it was based on. Is it based on the fact that they've been there for years, they've been volunteering for years, or is it based on recommendation from a staff member? I just wanted to, to get to grips with how you came to the decision that the trust, they were trustworthy by the Sure, you know. I think that's a brilliant question. Um, I think it's a it's 
a combination of the first being a really robust recruitment process. So obviously we go through assessment, um, recruitment checks, references, DBS check, training and ongoing supervision. So we've we've kind of and the, the discharge support role was active prior to COVID. So these were known volunteers to the trust. So they weren't new recruits that we put onto the virtual, the telephone based discharge support service. Mm -hmm. They were experienced volunteers who've gone through a lot of cases, supervision, training and development. And so when we transitioned them to the online, the telephone based service, we we knew them well and we knew that we could trust them with yeah. a certain level of autonomy when dealing with their cases. And then the supervision would pick up any issues um, or queries that they had that they weren't sure where the boundary lay. Yeah, yeah, no, that 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 makes sense. Yeah, that was just my query. I just thought, oh, how on earth did you sort of, you know, get to that decision? Yeah. My other my other question was, well, it's not a question. It was about, you know, the calls from home. I think it was uh, Jill and Sharon, I think, that had mentioned about, you know, folks taking calls uh, from home and ringing people. We've got a bereavement team that has come out of, obviously, COVID. It was palliative care and a section has broken off to be the bereavement team. So we've got some volunteers in there, similar to yourself, you know, people that we know well uh, that could sit in that team, but they come on site. Our bereavement team are very um, cautious about anything happening off site. And in a way I understand because they do a debrief with their volunteers after their calls, because some of them, it's very emotional. Uh, it's, you know, mentally draining as well. So. Uh, they do that. So I just wondered how how that was combated, because I think it's one thing over a phone, but it's another thing face to face, isn't it? Mm. We don't we don't have um, volunteers doing bereavement okay. counselling as such. Um, but I suppose if I can just put my other hat in, I used to manage various um, telephone helplines and you can actually do you can do quite in-depth debriefs using a platform like this actually okay. um but our volunteers don't do bereavement support um, and if we i think we will go to that but i think it'll be it'll be qualified counselors that we'll be looking for as well mm. Mm. right right thank you jill Pat, is that is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that that's yeah, it's great. It's just, I just wondered how the balance was with the yeah. support when somebody's ringing, you know, uh, families from home or you know what I mean, that sort of thing. I just I wasn't sure how that worked and how how they mm. get that debrief and that mental and emotional support. Yeah, I mean, I, but, yeah. I I can understand about um, people being quite protective about having things done in house and then it suddenly mm -hmm. goes out. I can understand mm -hmm. that as well. But, you know, we had quite a lot of resistance to recruiting some volunteers within our nursing team um, yeah. because that was the one area we didn't have volunteers. But now we do. Um, yeah. And they're the they're currently the only ones that are physically in the building and they've just been had their first vaccination as well as the staff. So, mm. it you know, it is mm. possible to overcome some of these barriers. Brilliant. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. And um, Sharon, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say to, to Patricia, I think that's where the supervision part of it comes in um, and that to, to give volunteers that opportunity to download and also the um, the reports um, that the providers from, from the calls, if there is service users who are struggling in certain areas, that then gets passed to us and it's about passing that to the right person. So whether it be they need a counsellor or maybe they, it needs to go to the crisis team that they're in crisis or maybe... I don't know what whatever that is so we have got some quite good connections with our local organizations and we have referred quite a number of them to different organizations councils for different reasons so it's just about us keeping um well connected with our volunteers to make sure that we're on top of it so we can we can signpost them accordingly brilliant brilliant Great. we are, we are um looking at uh crews some crews um training because I think a lot of trusts have got links, haven't they, with that organisation? And I think they do offer free training to volunteers and staff if you register with them. So yeah, we're we're looking to do that as well. But yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Okay, thanks all. Thanks, Pat. Um, Katie from East Sussex um, is asking who coordinates the virtual offering, checks, logs, etc. Is it voluntary services or clinical teams? Would anyone like to answer that for Katie? 
Hi, Katie. Sorry, I'm just jumping on here because I was uh, I was typing uh, my answer to you. So basically, we in volunteering, we have two people designated for the check-in and chat volunteers, for example, so that we have a manager and a coordinator that run the project. We do all the initial check, support, forms, uh, logs, and everything that the volunteer and the supervisor may need. And then once the volunteer is ready to start, is this then when we will hand it over to the supervisor, to the clinical supervisor. So at that point we will hand it over to the clinical team. So the clinical teams, they need to do the matching of the volunteer with a service users within their team and the support and supervision of that volunteer. We, When we talk to them, we said that the time commitment is in between like four to yeah, four to five hours every two weeks because they would need to do the supervision, but they would also need to check uh, the notes that the volunteer sends to them and also uploading them on the clinical systems. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that those are kind of like the main bits. We will have follow ups with the supervisors as well to make sure that, you know, everything is going well uh, with them. Uh, but yeah, definitely it's, that it's a time commitment from the clinical teams. That's why, you know, we don't have it embedded across everyone and every site at the moment because not everyone will have that kind of like team. And we get, um, we offer it as a kind of like um, learning and development opportunity for the staff who are on a band five or a band, yeah, band five or band six, and they want to gain a little bit more of like supervision experience. Thank you, Nuria. Everyone, I'm, I'm really sorry, we're going to have to bring it to a close. We could talk about this for the rest of the day, I'm sure. It's been absolutely fascinating and, uh, and eye-opening and inspiring. So thank you to our four speakers, um, Nuria, Jill, Sharon and Laura. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us all. Um, just as a general thing, I'd love to encourage everybody to keep sharing. Um, Today's speakers, perhaps you could share with us any documents that you think might be useful or that you've you've mentioned during your presentation, and we will share them via Connect with with other network members because we know how useful it is when people don't have to start from scratch with something. So it would really be much appreciated. Thank you, um, thank you all for joining us and for your questions. Um, it's been a, a really fascinating hour, and we hope to see you online soon. Thank you very much. Bye for now.